and, and good morning to everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me along today, Mark. Oh, you're very welcome, Mark. Great that you can be uh, you can be with us on this evidently quite cold, foggy Manchester <laughs> Manchester yeah. morning where the radiators need turning up. So, um, so yeah, I thought um, it'd just be great uh, if we could just just kick off really with um, just you telling us a little bit about what your what your role is today. Um, I know many people on this call know you uh, well and have, have followed your career for a while, but for those of you that don't, um, yeah, what are what are you what are you doing today? Yeah, so my, my my main role, I'm the, the CEO here at Manchester Pride. Uh, Manchester Pride, which um, a lot of people still don't yet know, is one of the UK's leading LGBT plus um, charities. We are responsible for delivering the annual celebration uh, and activism campaign for Pride here in Greater Manchester, uh, Manchester City Centre. Um, but also we run a number of initiatives throughout the year um, to support LGBT plus people throughout Greater Manchester and, and abroad. Um, my role uh, as CEO essentially is to develop, um, design, and then have a strategy approved by our Board of Trustees. And obviously the implementation of that, and, and I'm supported by a wonderful team of, of people uh, who are helping us to steer the organisation um, as we're leading the way for the modern Pride movement. Excellent. Thanks for that. And I know you, you always talk about the fact that you never you never intended to do this job. This wasn't something that you kind of <laughs> set your sights on and kind of worked towards. So could you tell us a little bit about what that journey was like, uh, how, how you got into that position? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been working with Manchester Pride for a number of years now. I think I, it started all way back in 2004 uh, when I was asked to come on board and do some, um, some well, I started do, doing some voluntary work, consulting with the festival to try and find sponsors um, or commercial partners to generate even, uh, revenue to support the growing infrastructure and the costs for the celebrations. Um, so I started in 2004 um, as a sponsorship consultant um, and then um, also supporting the event on site as a voluntary uh, events manager. Um, I was doing that for perhaps, I think it was about nine years um, that I was um, consult consulting on Manchester Pride. And then in 2013, the organisation was restructured and for the first time brought in a CEO. Um, and unfortunately, it was an appointment that, that didn't quite work out well for, for the individual or for the organisation. Um, and at that time, um, I'd been working closely uh, with, with the CEO and with the team in, in my current role. And it was suggested that I put myself forward for, for the role. Um, I, I really wasn't interested at all. You know, I was working in, as, as a, 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 in a freelance capacity at the time. Um, and I had to do quite a lot of self-reflection, really. It was upon a couple of comments from um, some close friends who had made me consider as to whether or not they, you know, I, I was best placed to do that, given the experience that I'd had with the organisation. Um, and yeah, I, I decided to throw my hat in the ring because when I was reflecting, I, I kind of uncovered a passion that I'd not really realised was there. And it was uh, made me reflect on, on myself, the journey that I'd been on, um, because it's only throughout my, my tenure uh, through Manchester Pride that I became comfortable with who I was. Uh, and and then and, and then actually came out, you know, what was with Manchester Pride. Um, so that was that's how it all began. I threw my hat in the ring. I went through the interview process uh, and I've been here ever since. And it's been the most incredible job that I've, I've ever had. Awesome. It's really interesting, that kind of uh, interweaving of your own personal story with the organization story and how you kind of both have both have grown together in a way. I mean, you're, you're a queer person of color. How, how has that kind of um, it intersected with with that journey? What? What do you feel that's kind of um, that's that's kind of brought to brought to your story, I suppose, in this? Yeah. OK, now that now um, we might need to add the, another hour into this session because there's a lot to say on this topic. Right. So I'll, I'll just start with, with my own personal reflections and then maybe share a little bit more about about my journey. Um, naturally, I'm a very private person, so I don't often talk about lived experience um, or reflect personal experiences in my professional career. And it was only during the um, pandemic, throughout lockdown, that, that I was forced to, to stop and, and check myself and check in with what's happening around me to really be a bit more outspoken um, about what it means to be a queer person of colour um, in this space, what it means to be a queer person of, of colour in an alleged homogenous uh, community um, and, and the wider implications um, that we have to face and the discrimination that we face on a daily basis as queer people of colour. Now, for, for me, um, my um, ethnicity has prevented a challenge throughout my life, really. You know, I, I can look back as far as um, I can remember in high school where the colour of my skin has definitely impacted 
um, who I was, how I was perceived, um, and some of those formative experiences when I was younger almost inhibited me. Um, I guess, you know, if you look at sy sy systemic racism, I was um, I was fortunate. I went through an 11 plus process when I was younger at school. I was fortunate to be able to, to be funded um, by the state to attend a private grammar school. And I got a lot of, you know, it taught me a lot. And there was some great um, education that I, that I got from that. But there weren't many, very many people who looked like me. Um, and I kind of had to learn to, to present myself in a way in which was better received to, to move forward throughout life and certainly within those forums within that forum should I say um, but it's only as I got older um, through some pretty difficult and harrowing experiences in my professional career within the role that I'm in now that forced me to reflect on the impact of the colour of my skin from from that time really um, there were incidents that made me perhaps not my confidence um, I wasn't as forthcoming uh, in, in the way in which I previously. Um, so you wouldn't, you know, I'd be less, I'd be less forthcoming to put my hand up to respond to questions in class, or I might think twice about putting myself forward um, for a sports day event or representing the, the, the school in anything um, because of how it may be perceived or the barriers that, that, that I'd faced um, at that point. Um, but that was that was something that I'd been learned to I'd almost learned to be invisible, you know, and not recognizing that I was working or having to work much harder than my peers just to get any level of recognition or progress within um, my career. Um, and then in I think it was about in, in this role in about 2018, I had an experience at Manchester Pride Festival, um, uh, uh, you know, an altercation with an individual who was displaying racist behaviors. Uh, and made several comments towards me, um, some of which were, were casual racism that they'd not really considered um, what they were saying or they weren't educated to fully understand the implications of what it was saying or, or, or the topic that they were broaching on. Um, but it forced me to, to stop and reflect uh, and question whether or not this was okay for me as the head um, of the modern pride movement in this city which celebrates and champions inclusivity uh, and diversity in all shapes and forms, was comfortable with, with, with the way in which I felt really unsafe as the head of the festival, you know, responsible head of the organization delivering that festival. I had a moment where I thought I feel really unsafe. And it was at that point that it made me question what the other experiences are of other queer um, people of color. And we embarked upon um, our first consultation specifically to gain input on what those um, experiences were. And it was harrowing when we were sitting through the, the outcome of that and the responses that we had. It was um, it was really Discon not not just disconcerting, but but disturbing, really. You know, to, to recognise that this level of racism was still rife, um, or, or to the level of which it was within proclaimed queer safe spaces. Um, and for somebody like me, I, I truly believe, and I'm not, you know, whether I've, I've I've heard this or been influenced by things that have been said in the past. I don't own this statement, but I certainly uh, abide by and support the notion that pride can't be for anybody unless pride is for everybody um so it's from that point that we we set upon our mission really i i i with the data that we'd collected i took that to our board of trustees and said that i, I feel like i have to do something more here as a queer person of color leading this organization and as one of the few queer people of color um in a leadership position in this city i have to use this platform to influence change within our communities um, and it's, it spurred me on to do quite a lot of things personally and professionally from the organization. Uh, you could see I got the support from the board to introduce the black and brown stripes initially, followed by the trans colors into our visual identity. Um, when we did that beginning of 2019, um, I hadn't factored in the facts that, that, that it could be quite so divisive, um, which again only um, further exemplified the issues that that we were facing with racism um, within the communities. Um, so in, in terms of having that level of recognition, that, that self-awareness, understanding um, what the impacts of being a queer person of colour are in, in this space, that was the first time that I started to speak about my lived experience, um, then followed it up with, with the research and the data and took actions towards moving forward to spark a conversation, to initiate real change, and it's 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 one of the when I think about if you think about legacies that that you might leave uh, behind from from a role for me it's one of the proudest moments that I'll have 
at the time I was isolated. I was very lonely, you know, not a single one of my peers stepped out in support of what it was that we were doing. And, and, and within the sector that we work in, for me, that again was quite shocking that there was, there was a silence that fell around me um, because I'd been outspoken about why it was so important to include the black and brown stripe. Um, the level of hate that was leveled at, at me and the organization, again, only go uh, only only strengthened um, the evidence that this was really needed and that we shouldn't be afraid to embrace this topic and, and that we were working towards creating inclusive spaces for all of us. And therefore, we have to have these difficult conversations. But I'm, I'm really proud of the legacy because there were those who fell aside at the time that now you will see championing. Um, the, the the progress flag that that we that we now use across everything that we do, um, almost trying to take ownership of it um, as well. Which for me is it's it's bittersweet. It's great that we've got that level of exposure. The conversation is continuing. We're starting to address these issues, but um, it, it's that's just one display of how it's quite difficult um, for a queer person of color uh, within this sector or with any role that, that they're doing to to to, to step out. Um, to have that conversation, to relate it to lived experience, to get people to listen, to understand, and then support what, what's right. I told you we might need an extra hour, so I'm going to punctuate myself there. I might <laughs> give you any opportunity to, to break it up or steer in any direction. No, that's great. Yeah, thanks so much for, for sharing that. And, you know, I'm just really struck by how, how much extra effort, work, energy that, that, that you have to put in to kind of really bring yourself, your authentic self into this. Uh, but the benefits of being able to do that, you know, um, are, are just massive, not just for you, but for the community as a result of the work that you do. I mean, could you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, there's some great lessons and some insights in that. What, yeah. what, what, what on, on this journey, which, you know, has been incredible for the organization, you know, we, the, 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 the scale of it compared to when you, you took the reins to where it is now, it's just orders of magnitude. What what have you what have you learned along the way? You, you know, we've got other leaders on this call, leading different organisations, businesses, some of the charitable. Is there anything that that you know you would you would want to kind of pass on to them from from experience in that journey? Yeah, it's been an incredible journey, and it's been one that I wouldn't change. I've learned so much, and I'm continuing to learn. I think that's what's so exciting about this role, and this is what keeps me switched on, engaged, and moving forward. Um, for me, this was my first leadership role of this magnitude. And, and whilst the organization was a very different place when I stepped in, um, what 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 for me was key from that moment uh, and has carried through throughout my tenure within this role is listening. Uh, and it's the very first thing that I did when, when I stepped into this role was stopped and listened. I, I literally made myself available to as many people as would talk to me as possible, created public forums at that time, um, as many different ways in which people could engage and just stepped out there. You, you know, a pride is, is part of a, a world movement. Manchester Pride is pioneering and is leading the way. And I was so fortunate uh, to be at the helm of that. But it's important that everybody, you know, from, from this perspective, um, within the organisation, externally understood that I, I didn't own pride. I was just here and had the fortune to, to, to steer the organisation. Uh, and whilst it's my job to, to make decisions, you know, that's principally the job of a CEO is you're a chief decision maker. Um, those decisions have to be informed on what it is that our communities want. It's the very first thing that I did uh, is embarked upon a series of listening um, initiatives, we'll, we'll call them listening groups went out there and asked people, literally knocked on doors, what, what do you want? What do you expect from the Manchester Pride? And we've been doing it ever since. Um, and at times where people, uh, when I stepped in um, to this, this role, the organisation was, was fractured. You know, it, it, there were meant lots of disconnection and it was not, there was not harmony um, or masses of support for the organisation. Me and my team, uh, which was, well, I say me and my team, there were three of us then compared to where we are now. It was quite a different landscape. But me and my team had to work so hard and knocking on doors and forging relationships or getting people to listen to us. And then having to build that so that they'd start to trust us when we were sharing the feedback that we had from our communities, outlining the plans of how we're going to move forward and saying, and please come with us and please trust us. I know you don't know me from Adam. I know you've never met these people before, but this is what we're going to do. Um, and through genuinely listening and sharing the findings from, from what those listening exercises uncovered, outlining a plan and moving forward was how we were able to build relationships and gain trust. Now, we've been doing that ever since, uh, and it's very interesting because I'm sure this is going to lead us to talk about um, listening and community engagement at peaks and at troughs. 
Um, so that started off as a time where we were literally having people protesting outside our offices about decisions that had been made by my predecessors or predecessors of, of, of the then board as well. And which is quite, you know, marked quite a scary place for, for, for me and my two colleagues to, to rock up at work and to have this level of confrontation at, at the door. But again, that was a learning exercise um, because I wanted to listen. So I went down there and, 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 and said, can, you know, I'm here. What, what can I talk to you? Can, you know, I, I want to listen. Um, interestingly, that group were, were not interested in talking. They didn't really want to be to be heard or didn't want me to, to give them that opportunity. But for me, that, that's been the single key thing to achieving success is making sure that I'm plugged into communities and listening. And I've learned to be a good listener. Um, I think actually, you know, I, I, I was talking to somebody last year and reflecting. I think it's something an attribute I'd always, I've always had. Um, I didn't realize that it was that, that not everybody, you know, often you don't, you think that people have the same qualities or, or, or as you. And in my head, I thought everybody was a good listener or had the patience to listen. I didn't realize that was a, a quality that I had. So I, I feel a bit fortunate. I might have had a foot, you know, a, a foot up the ladder already there in that I, I, I like to listen. Um, but when times are good, um, you can reflect upon the listings that you've got, share them. When times are bad, you get more voices um, and, and, and much more input. And again, it enables you to get rich um, understanding of, of what um, communities want um, and then reflect that in your work. That was a long way to say that for me, what's been key and continues to be is, is listening and then responding to that. No, I think that detail is really important, though, because, you know, you if, if, if all people needed was a few words, you know, you could write that on the back of a business card, couldn't you? But it's actually, it's yeah. actually the devil's in the detail in terms of this. You can't just say to somebody to be a good leader, listen, you know, you, it's about those examples about you going out there, speaking to people, protecting outside of your office, you know, that's the degree that you're, you're taking it. And I think that's really inspiring for people to hear. So I think you um, slightly preempted this, but um, you know, listening something that's that's that's, that's been kind of happening again uh, in a, in a really deep way uh, at, at Manchester Pride recently, and I'm sure many people on on the call will uh, will be aware of, of, of various kind of you know bits of commentary about the organisation about some of the changes that have been made. I'm I'm, I'm kind of not interested in in that necessarily. I'm, I'm I'm interested in kind of um, your experience really as, as as a leader and the decisions that you made during that time. Few people, you know, it's a it's a real privilege, I guess, to be at the helm of an organisation and a brand that people are so passionate about. But it's a double edged sword, isn't it? In terms of in, in terms of that passion, and and you've experienced that in, in such a visceral way recently with with what's gone on. I think people here would be really keen to understand, you know, what that was like and um and and some of the learning that you got out of that out of that process, really. Yeah. Um well then for, you know, first and foremost, you struck upon something there, Matt. Yeah, but when when you mentioned pride, there is so much passion. People have so much passion for pride because we all have our own sense of what pride is and what it means to us as queer people and i use the term queer as a catch-all um, for lgbtqi plus people um not not to offend anybody who are not familiar with it but it helps me to get through conversation rather than saying lgbtq plus all, all, all day long so that's, that's why i'm using that term um but yeah you know when as, as queer people pride means so much to us i mean you've got so many so many different views and opinions of what it is and, and what it means to somebody it's naturally uh, going to spark interesting conversation and it has done from from day dot. Um, you know, there are as an organisation, there are decisions that that are uh, that we have to take um, to make sure that we are most representing our communities and what it is that our communities want. And it's important um, for me to outline that every decision that this organisation has made since I've been involved has been based on what it is that our communities have asked us to do, uh, and which direction they'd like us to to to, to move towards, or what the need, the requirement is for specific communities that might need uh, a level of equity, um, focusing on elevating the, the, their needs and issues. And when it comes to the impact of that, if you're perceived to make a what's perceived as a controversial decision, yeah, that can be quite harrowing. You know, I mentioned earlier when we first in, in, um, changed our visual identity to include uh, black and brown and trans colours, and the level of alleged controversy that that sparked, it was not controversial, it was sensitive uh, because it was new and it was changed. Um, but as an, as an individual, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, I'm not afraid to be a disruptor where it's required and where communities are asking for me to, to do that. Um, when it comes to decisions that are made um, at, at that level that become unpopular, 
it, it becomes incredibly challenging. Um, you know, if, if I look back to 2021, um, as we come out of the, the pandemic, where we weren't able to deliver the single um, largest street, you know, uh, event, that, that the event that is the single largest revenue income stream for the organization, we were so proud and fortunate to still be here, to still exist, um, that I, I guess we were we were riding cloud, we were on cloud nine. We'd come off the back of 2020, delivered a virtual festival, a celebration. Um, the, the pandemic was still looming. We weren't aware in 2021 at that point whether or not we'd be able to deliver the physical festival or in what guise that could look for. Um, and sometimes things come along unexpectedly and you don't see them coming. Um, at that time, when there was a lot of interest in the decisions that were made by the organisation as to what we were going to be doing with um, grant funding and how we could appropriate that moving forward, it again displayed um, a, a divide amongst our communities. You know, decisions were made by the organisation um, and there were some key lessons for me there and for the organisation at that point. Um, largely, as, as I'm there, I'll go straight on to it, largely communication. You know, we, we thought we were effectively communicating that time. We were limping through. We didn't have a full team, much the same way that other organisations didn't at that point. But we thought we were really clear about what it was we were doing and how we were doing things. We were not clear enough. Uh, and that for me was a huge lesson that had come off the back of that. Whilst we've been engaged and plugged in and, and delivering uh, what it is that, that our communities have asked us, we've not really been talking about it or providing reasoning or clearly displaying why decisions were being made before they were made or bringing people along on the journey. Um, we'd, we'd almost taken our eye off the ball at that moment because it's something that we'd focused a lot on previously. Um, and when things, you know, so when, when that struck, it, it became almost heartbreaking for us all because I'm, like I said, Early, I'm supported by a team of passionate, brilliant, skilled people. We are people um, and we are members of and or allies of, of our communities. So it, it, it kind of, it's that, you have to, it's that harsh reminder of, whoa, are people forgetting that I'm a person that's doing a job for an organization that I'm passionate about? Um, as an organization, we, we, we learned lessons as to how, how to better communicate with our communities and be in touch with them. Um, but most importantly for me, and, and this is something that I learned um, through working with somebody uh, uh, a couple of years ago, they, they, used, they said that one of the values that they use is admit it, fix it, move on. And for me, that's kind of been something that I've always adhered to. We as humans and, and as organisations, we, we make mistakes. None of us are infallible. You know, it, that's, that, that's what happens as part of the learning process. And um, for me, I think um, it's almost a test of character as to how you respond to that. Um, if you recognize that a mistake has been made, then, then you know, I'm almost always the first to be like, okay, whoa, that we didn't get that right. We need to fix that. How do we fix that? And then make sure we learn from it and, and move on. Um, so for me, at times like that, it, it's really, it's harrowing because I think if you have, if you have, when we, there was such uproar and miscommunication in the media, uh, misrepresentation amongst communities and on social media, but that level um, of ferociousness towards the team you know for me it's like I want to put my arms around everybody and start to protect but I think when people get carried away with a narrative that they perceive there's been wrongdoing it's very easy to forget that there are people attached to that organization um and therefore it, it became it, it, you know it's for me I've got thick skin and sadly I've become accustomed used to that by not being afraid to move things forward um, and the level of racism that was targeted at me previously reared its head again at that time, uh, which was then supported by outspoken and influ influential people in positions that should have known better um, and, and could have stood by me from an ally's perspective to recognise that there's not wrongdoing here. There's an unpopular decision that's been made. You, you could have done better at communicating why these things are happening. But instead, people took it as an opportunity to almost, I don't know, swipe. This is it's where everything comes out. I think you should do it like this. Why haven't you been doing that? Everybody has their view as to what they would do in your role as a leader. And that for me is one of the most difficult things to manage expectations at times like that. You almost want to, you know, you have to step back and listen to everybody, but your role as a leader is to make decisions based on what it is that you, you've established as a strategy to move forward. And, and for me, at moments like that, the, the, the most important thing that, that I did was checking with my values, um, you know, because it made me think incidents like that make you think, am I, am I wrong? Have I done something wrong? Is this me? You really check yourself. 
but I check my values. Am I abiding by my values? And am I following the, 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 you know, the plan and the strategy that's been outlined by our organization? When the answer is yes, I take great reassurance from that. But it's um, th th these challenges are very difficult to navigate. Um, and for me, I just, yeah, I take, it's all for me, my values are my safety net because they, they enable me to stay on track. And that's how I live my life. And, and if I can't support those values, then I know there's something not quite right. But if I am, um then then i've you know i've got confidence that that, that that's the right thing that's really uh, waving cool. out there matt so yeah, how, yeah I, I hope that's responded to yeah. what it is you actually asked me <laughs> absolutely i think a great sort of bonus tip there from you in terms of you know really developing a strong sense of what those values are so that they can be there for you in a time where you you really need them or where you might be questioning yeah. uh your, your, your decisions um yeah it's really interesting how that tallies with what you were saying before about just what the primary importance that you put on listening but actually when some of those things are being said or you know monumentally unfair or racist or prejudiced the the the, the difficulty in having to listen to all that actually but your bravery in continuing to listen to try and extract things from that dialogue that that that, that can that can help to kind of um heal that divide i suppose uh really struck me i i i think that um yeah, it, it, it was kind of interesting to to sort of watch it happen. And one of the decisions that I think was was really quite brave was to to cancel uh, Manchester Pride Live, the festival element of of it, in response to the community consultation. You know, many people leading businesses, particularly on this call, will be will be used to being pushed by their board to increase revenue. And you've made a decision there to actually cut off the the largest uh, stream of income for the charity um, because of, of of listening to that community. What was it like to make a decision like that? Wow. Um, okay. Well, well, a couple, couple of things for me, and again, this is this is me being genuine. We've I've become accustomed to making decisions that are responding to what it is that our communities want, um, and it's not, you know, um, it, 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 rather than it's not. I don't, you know, the narrative that was portrayed at the time is that, oh, this is the Mark Fletcher show or Mark Fletcher thinks, is, you know, this is not, I'm a CEO, I'm doing a job working for an organisation and it's and, and my job is clear to me and I know what I need to do. Part of that job is listening and responding to our communities. So for me, that decision it wasn't that hard from that perspective. It was, okay, we need to, we need to radicalise what we're doing. We need to think about this. We need to review what people are saying now because it's very different to what they were saying 12 months ago like monumentally different so we had to question why we were, why we were delivering that event what it did for the organization and how we could respond to it so for me that that wasn't a challenge really it was something that we've been doing since i've stepped in i've been doing since i've stepped into this role um but when you think about the work that had gone into um developing the you know uh, manchester pride as an organization as a festival the level of impacts that we began to achieve back from 2017, 18, and then 19 globally and being so influential for, for the Pride movement, that's when you, you realise it was quite um, a bold and brave decision to take. And, you know, I, I did, I, I can reflect now on the papers that I was preparing to take to our board. I had, you know, who, who again, I think were probably as shocked as the next person to, to think, how, how what, what, how, what is this you're suggesting? Why are you suggesting this? You know, that off the back of the media uh, campaign alone in 2019, we achieved over 10 billion impacts um, in stories, all of which referred to what Manchester Pride was and what we were about. Now, we'd harvested that level of, of exposure um, and media interaction over the years, build that up so that people can understand why Pride is important and what Manchester Pride is doing to lead the movement globally today. So we'd come from that position of, of um, you know, inviting Ariana Grande to come and celebrate our identities with us as a staunch ally um, herself. Um, it, it, it was you know it was it, it was a, a it was a cultural moment that we created and that was in response to what it was that our communities wanted every year we were asked can we bring Ariana Grande can we bring Kylie can we bring Madonna every year in our post-event surveys so when we responded to that in a way in which we had the opportunity to do because of the developments in in, in the um the gay village party the level of production and infrastructure that's required for a show like that it's not possible to deliver it on, on such a small scale um, in where we deliver our gay village party. So we, we had to 
still, you know, we had to look elsewhere because it's what our communities wanted. When we delivered it, it was so well received and we'd established a, a new commercial model for the charity that was going to further support the objects um, enabled us to, to increase revenue, as, as you've said, and therefore increase the reach of our work and distribute greater funding, have a great level of impacts. That's what it was designed to do. But with such a disconnect um, and with people almost, I think, throughout the pandemic had, had become disconnected with that event, starting to question what it was about and had, you know, what, what's the relevance of, of a pop concert in, in the context of a Pride um, festival and or celebration. We, we questioned it from, from that perspective based on what it was that, that we saw. And it was, it took the bravery of the organisation to, to be developing a commercial model that, you know, that, that would be a lot trickier to sustain, shall we say, when you, when, when we, we got to such a grand scale of revenue um, and um, reduced our risk with a commercial model that, that, that could sustain the organization with a big ticket event. It, it, it was a brave decision, but it was the right decision because it's what our communities were asking for us. It shocked the team, you know, when, when, um, when I first put forward the recommendation as to what, 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 what my vision was and how we, you know, how we were gonna to respond to this. Um, there was a lot of shock, but also there was a great deal of understanding because it was our communities were divided on this and they, they still are today. So it's literally 50 50 of our communities that, that respond to us that are calling for us to bring that type of event back um, versus those who are not and say stay as you are. So we have to revisit it each year um, again and make sure we are plugged in and connected uh, and doing the right thing um it was for, for me uh, as, as a commercially motivated individual it was that it was a real challenge i am baffling me thinking how can i how can i go in there and present almost two million pounds worth of, of of revenue less um but then when you look at that that's what it costs almost to deliver an event on that scale so you, we're not there to, to generate profit you know we're there to raise as much many funds as we can to support um our grassroots organizations groups and charities across the region um, but it was, it, it, for me, I, I like a challenge and that provided the challenge to look at different ways to be able to generate, um, to raise income, to support our communities. And yeah, well, well I'm really proud of, of what it is we, we pulled off in 2022, which showed us that that is possible to do that in that way. Um, it was, it was an interesting time and I didn't know how it was going to go essentially, but it being 50-50 our board had to make a decision as to which they felt was was the strongest case um, from what it was I was providing. And, and at, at that time, my recommendation was that, you know, we don't carry that event forward. Mm. That's one thing I'm really struck by with that is just this this theme of, you know, your role is to decide as a CEO and you have to make those decisions. Those decisions are tough sometimes, you know, no matter how much you listen, not everybody's going to be on board with those. And you you you, you need to go ahead with what's going to push the strategy forward. And I think there's a lot to take from that for, for, for people on the call. I'm going to open up to, to questions now from from the uh, from from those tuning in. So feel free to to drop those uh, in in the chat and and feel free to drop your thanks to Mark as well for joining us today if you wish. Um, I've got a question here uh, around um, intersectionality, uh, asking where does Manchester Pride stand in terms of our older and older older LGBT plus community? I thought you might yeah. want to pick that one. Yep. Okay. So one of the findings from um, our Pride and Our Futures consultation when we first start, when we remodeled it in 2021, um, was just how much of a gap there was intergenerationally um, when, when it comes to the, the Pride movement, what it is and what the expectations of our communities are. For us, it's incredibly important to listen to all voices. For me, I'm a true believer that you have to look where you come from in order to have an idea of where it is that you want to go. Um, and I think it was maybe six years ago, I first started to develop an educational piece um, for, for the charity that we've not had before to engage with um, younger audiences, to educate them about what it was before they were along, what the, what the Pride movement was, how it was that we've gained the freedoms that we've got today and how important it is to learn from that, to respect that and to move it forward. So for us, we are all, you know, it, it's... Um, it's nature. We are all aging and, and it's important that we stay connected to our communities at all levels. So we reflect that in our programming. And when it comes to making sure that we are being as representative as possible, we listen to everybody. And it's interesting when you look at what the, 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 what the results of our consultations are, 
Um, there's a, a much less understanding of, of, of gender, um, or it came out through our data um, and, the, and what the modern, what the Pride movement was about with older people than it was with with younger people. Um, and it's our job, as as you know, as the Pride organizer in, in this city, to to bring those communities together and to to enable shared perspectives to be heard. Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges is, is pulling voices in together. But where where we have uh, an intergenerational divide, which is so radically removed from each other. It's our it's our job to bring them closer together. Uh, and we started to do that in 2021, before the consultation. We did much more of it in 2022. And we've garnered and, and generated a level of interest um, and, and almost hunger for education on Pride Movement. And we now embed that in pretty much everything that we do. So all of our events, all of our initiatives, there'll be a level of learning to understand what this is about, where we are, so that everybody can understand. because. If you look back in the ages, you know, if you look at some of the most harrowing um, and challenging times um, that the modern pride movement has navigated, um, the nuances are, 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 have changed. Um, you know, we have, and, and now from personal conversation, I, I, I talk personally about conversations that I felt actually for a second in response to this. When speaking, when engaging with and talking to older people about their experiences, their expectations, um, and what their desires for, for pride is today. Um, it's been interesting to hear what it is to them and how nostalgia it, it plays a key part in making sure that we're able to deliver what it was that they had when they were younger. Um, however, the issues that were being faced and the conversations that were being had are very different. Um, gender had, had, it was just not on the radar 15 years ago the way it is today. And the level of, um, of understanding of what, what that means to explore your gender by younger people today is something that not even, you know, my gen uh, uh, my um, grand old age um, was not as pre prevalent, you know, when, when I was growing up. Um, and for us, it's about bringing those conversations together and that level of understanding of, of experience so that we can have mutual respect. It's, it's a big challenge, but that's, you know, for me, that's what Pride is here to do, is to bring us together, to listen, bring together um, and exist in one space harmoniously. That's the dream, right? It's a, it's a big challenge, isn't it? Um, but yeah. thanks very much for that. And um, yeah, thanks for that question. I'm sure people would... Uh, would 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 value checking out Silver Pride UK and um yes. and the work that they do um with online events. The choir I'm part of actually actually sang uh, one of your online events. So thanks very much for the question. Um so um so we got another question here, which is how do you ensure when you're listening that you don't just end up listening to the loudest voices? Yeah, that's you know what I'm not gonna qualify that by saying it's a great question. I hate when people say that to me. Oh, great question. Well, it's my question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so what, what I will say instead is it's an interesting question because often it's those who shout loudest that get heard the most. That's just not for me. If you're responding to those who are shouting loudest, that's not authentic listening. And it's my job and our job to listen to all of the voices out there. And it's those that are the least heard that we need to focus on elevating um, because it, it, it's interesting. If, if, when, 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 you know, when exploring the principle of equity, if you talk about further marginalized communities within this one um, alleged homogenous LGBT community, um, we can't elevate uh, and, and improve the lives of those further marginalized people if we're not listening to them intently. Um, so the bigger voices are big and booming and where they will have a point to make, we listen to them, but we have to go out and actively work to listen and seek the opinions of the voices that are not speaking or feel that they are not confident to, to, to have their, their say. Um, so it's a challenge and it's one that we started working on three years ago. We're getting better and better at doing this. Uh, again, it's testament to the work that the team does. We work in our, throughout the communities and throughout Greater Manchester all year long, knocking on the doors of uh, grassroots community organizations and groups and individuals just to make sure that they know that there is a place for them to be heard with Manchester Pride. We listen to what it is that they're telling us they're needed. And, and our board at the moment, our current strategy uh, prioritizes um, queer, trans, intersex people of color and a wider trans communities um, through our activities to elevate those voices that, that, that were lesser heard. Um, it's, it's difficult, certainly when there's times of pressure, you know, you can hear some big booming voices making or creating a narrative on social media that gets carried away with itself. And it's difficult not to, to, to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, I have to respond to that or oh, that they're, they're mean, that's not quite right what they're saying because everybody's going to believe it. It doesn't matter. People will believe what they want to believe. Um, but if you're true to your values and adhering to a strategy that's been outlined, the, the, the truth will, will always come out anyway through the results of, of the work that you're doing. So 
I give big answers to small questions. Again, I've got to apologise for that. I, I hope that responded. I don't apologise. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, really struck by kind of listening as a doing word there in terms of, you know, it's not just enough to kind of put up a sign and say, I'm listening if you want to talk to me. You going out there, finding the voices that aren't being heard, finding people that maybe don't, uh, that aren't in the habit of speaking because they're just not used to it, not being listened to. They're just not used to it uh, having any any impact and really seeking them out. Um, so, so yeah, that's really uh, really inspiring to to hear. Um, we've we've not um, got any other questions, but I just had a, a quick one if I can be cheeky and 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 slip in again, which was just to ask about your um, all equals charter. Because I know that's some that's a kind of offer from Manchester Pride that's aimed at organisations, and we've got a lot of organisational leaders on the call here today. So I thought it might be worth just checking in to see what that is, and and yeah, how it might be able to help people on the call. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for this question, actually, because this almost brings it full circle. I know I've ranted a lot today. It kind of brings it full circle to how I opened up today. The All Equals Charter is an initiative that we developed off the back of that racist experience that I had. Uh, Manchester Pride Festival, Festival back in 2017. Um, when, when we, as one of the actions off the back of that, we considered how we could make our spaces safer um, for people of colour. So we started to develop this charter. Um, and as we developed it further and further, we recognised the power of change that it could impact. Um, and today, as we, we present it, the, the charter is it, it's our, it's our programme to help businesses and organisations understand, recognise and then challenge any form of discrimination uh, in the workplace. Um, it's, it's designed to help make the workplace a safer space, um, recognizing all of our protected characteristics, but also places as well, um, theater, sports centers, bars, restaurants, um, by striving towards an accreditation, they can you know, make clear that they are a safe space um, for, for queer people. Um, and it, the way in which it, 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 it's established and it's being developed, I mean, it, it's quite outstanding. It, it's, it's quite groundbreaking what it does. It, it's not at all like any other charter that exists out there um, within the sector at the moment. Um, by signing up to the charter, organisations um, are actually, well, well, basically are aligning to a set of actions guided by values and principles. Um, and it's peer to peer. Um, so it's a learning opportunity as well. It, it, it's a living charter. Um, which really promotes equality for all. It, it's our way of making sure that we can have um, a positive impact um, within the commercial organisation and business sector to help push forward the modern pride movement in, in that sphere. Because um, again, it, it's when you look at a charter or if you look at some, any type of index, there's always reasoning behind it, how organisations can learn to introduce policy. Um, by being part of the All Equals Charter, you, you're supporting the modern pride movement because it's influencing change, real change uh, and making the spaces more freely uh, safe and, and accessible to, to LGBT plus people for all our protected characteristics. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at, I run the risk of falling into sales mode, so I'm going to leave it there and we'll open to any questions on it, but you can get all, all, touch, um, all the information about that is held on, on our website. And I would strongly advocate for everybody to become a member, even if you don't seek to be accredited, it's going to be mightily important. If you just see some of the organisations that are coming on board with it, you'll, you'll see how the modern pride movement is helping to change the nature of the workplace. And certainly from an organisational perspective, there are some huge companies on there and then there are some very small venues and everything in between local authorities yeah i'd, I'd, I'd um i would um ask everybody to, to please go and check it out great thank i'll do you i'll do your sales job for you and stick the link in the chat there so i was too check that out thank you. <laughs> um so yeah thanks thanks for that we're going to open to uh to, to breakout rooms in a second just yeah the, the words that are kind of resonating for me are you know listen you know, decide and um, know your values. You know those those yeah. those things really really come across in the way that you kind of um, reacted. So um, so yeah, uh, it's it's amazing to see as a Mancunian myself, a proud Mancunian. It's amazing to see Manchester. You know, hold such a such an important and influential uh, pride event. So thank you for for all the work that you do, and thank you very much for for joining us on this call today. I know you've got a busy schedule, 